evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out into the barn uh, on this nice, cool evening uh, to hear our uh, guest speaker tonight, John Davis, and uh, hear about his experiences and his journey on his trek east and um, his vision for the Eastern Wildway. I'm Jennifer Shuey. I'm the Executive Director of Clearwater Conservancy. And I see some familiar faces and some new faces, so if you'd like to learn more about us, we have lots of information in the back. We also uh, feel free to go and fill up your, your ice water throughout the time, too. Before John starts, I just want to uh, have Molly Hetrick share a little bit about this facility here that you're in, and uh, in the new building that we're in. <laughs> But we might be in, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Dan, and thank you for coming, everybody. Um, as Jen said, my name is Molly. I'm the supervisor here, so we want to welcome you, and thank you for coming out. We're so excited to hear John's presentation. Um, we selected the barn tonight because it was a nice, dark place so that you could see his PowerPoint well, but the new building is cooler, so John's going to start in here, and then we're going to move to the other building so that we can finish our discussions in the cooler uh, setting. But this building is actually, as you can tell, an old restored barn, and so we've done a lot of different activities in here. We rented out for groups to use. We have dances and concerts, and we've had meetings, art shows, all sorts of things. So it's a really fun space that we get to use for lots of multiple purposes. But as most of you saw, we just finished construction on the Spring Creek Education Building, which is really exciting for us because our barn is only three seasons, and so the fourth this new building will be four seasons, and we'll be able to start doing some winter programming. So watch for some fun winter stuff coming um, out to you this winter. So thank you. And we're super excited to, to have John here. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all for coming out in this heat. I didn't really expect many people at all to show up. <clears throat> Almost didn't make it myself. But <laughs> a special thanks to the good folks at Clearwater Conservancy and Millbrook Marsh Nature Center for hosting mm -hmm. My talk on my travels up the Eastern Wildway, uh, Jennifer and Molly and Katie and others have all been very generous with their time and their and their wisdom. I'm really grateful for that. And what I'm going to be, I'll try to be a little quick with the slides because it is so hot. We'd probably be more comfortable in the other building. Uh, but please feel free to stop me at any point as I'm going through the slides. If you have questions or comments, and please forgive me if I flub up on the technology. I'm a bit slow with machines, so. Uh, but anyway, again, I'm John Davis. I'm doing a long trek through the wilder parts of eastern North America um, to partly just to have the fun of exploration and partly to try to tell stories about the importance of wildlife and wildlife habitat connections, the importance, the importance of big wild spaces and the links between them. And the main group that is uh, sponsoring this group, um, this effort, Trek East, is a collaborative effort with involving many conservation groups and citizen conservationists and agencies. And, but it is sponsored in large part by sorry, the Wildlands Network. And the Wildlands Network is a, a small but ambitious organization that uh, has as its mission to protect and, and reconnect wildlife habitats across North America. Uh, the Wildlands Network has a staff of only about 15, so the idea of saving North America's natural heritage is extremely ambitious for such a small group. And, and the Wildlands Network necessarily works very closely with on-the-ground groups like Clearwater Conservancy and Millbrook Marsh Nature Center. Wildlands Network helps provide the science and the mapping and other tools to help us identify key habitat linkages, but the on-the-ground on work is done by you folks. The Wildlands Network tends to think in terms of continental wildways, and this is a very early map that just suggests where we might most feasibly, in the near term, uh, protect and restore habitat connectivity on a large enough scale to ac accommodate the full range of native wildlife. The basic model that the Wildlands Network is trying to promote is large core reserves surrounded by compatible use zones or buffer zones and connected by wildlife corridors. In the compatible use zones and in some of the wildlife corridors, there would be human habitation as we have across much, much of the east. But generally, wild cores would usually be wilderness <laughs> or, or national park level protection. And obviously, it's easier to get big parks and wilderness areas established in the west than in the east. But we do have some opportunities in the east as well as in the west. 
As most of you know, one of the big threats to wildlife in the United States, and to a lesser degree in Canada, is habitat fragmentation. The biggest source of habitat fragmentation in North America is roads. And one of the painful things I've realized on this journey, I should say, my journey is a combination of hiking, paddling, and bicycling. And as I'm bicycling, I'm becoming just painfully, viscerally aware of the ways that roads divide and fracture habitats and the way they kill animals. We all use roads. I depend on roads just like the rest of you, but I'm hoping that my trek will help generate awareness that we really ought to think about how we can make our roads more passable for wildlife so that they don't fracture habitats so much and how we might drive in a more conscientious manner so as not to hit animals so often. I'm seeing incredible amounts of road kill. It's very depressing at times. This wall is along the, along the U.S.-Mexico border. I think it's in Texas. And obviously that wall is going to prevent wildlife movement. And as, as many of you know, that um, under Homeland Security, there's a huge wall being erected along most of the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's a disaster for wildlife. It's much more effective at blocking wildlife movement than human move, movement. <laughs> so basically, we are, it's, a, it's a, a filter working backwards, you might say. Um, and one antidote to the problems of, of fragmentation caused by roads is broad overpasses. This one's in Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada. If we would put more of these and tunnels also underneath roads, then they would be more passable to wildlife and we could reduce the problems of road kill and save human lives at the same time. Many people are killed in accidents as they collide with wildlife too. So if we would, as we repair the nation's crumbling infrastructure, also put in underpasses and overpasses and make our roads more durable in the face of climate change and more permeable to wildlife, we would save money in the long run and we would save lives, animals, <coughs> and, um, animals including people. So the name of my track is uh, Trek East, and um, what originally was sort of a solo adventure involving conservation friends and colleagues has grown into something of a communications effort, thanks to the good work of the Wildlands Network, which by the way is, is um, simply at wildlandsnetwork.org. And I have a blog and I do a lot of writing on this journey, it's all on wildlandsnetwork.org. Though I'm basically a Luddite at heart, they've taught me how to use computers and iPhones and so forth. So I am tweeting and blogging, and I think we're, we are even on Facebook in some ways. And Trek East is the popular name we're using for this trip I'm taking, which is basically a, a, a wild ways scouting mission. Uh, as the slide mentions, I'm going roughly, I think it will be about 6,000 miles by the end. I've gone about 4,800 miles so far. I started in North Key Largo in southern Florida. And I'm making my, I made my way through a good bit of the southeast coastal plain and found that in better shape than I had expected, by the way. And now I'm, I'm going up along the Appalachians for the most part. And my end goal is the uh, Gaspé Peninsula of southern Quebec. Hope to, hope to end on cross-country skis in the Chickchock Mountains of southern Quebec in mid-November, if snow permits. Otherwise, I'll be hiking in the cold weather. This is the approximate line I'm taking. Obviously, it's not at all direct. The reason I'm winding and meandering so much is because I want to meet a broad cross-section of, of conservationists like you folks. I want to meet various conservation groups, government agencies that are involved in land management. I want to see different ecosystem types, habitat types. And the Wildlands Network staff worked very carefully to organize a trip that would allow me to see representative samples of a broad cross-section of ecosystems. So this is the line we came up with, and I've more or less followed that with some deviations. One reason, we were originally thinking the trip was going to be about 4,500 miles, and we're now thinking it would probably be at least 6,000. One reason for the, the difference is that I'm, I'm ending up taking a lot of side trips along the way because there's so many things to see and so many great groups to meet and so forth. So it ends up being a a longer trip than we had originally anticipated. What we, and one of the goals of this trip is to prom promote the idea of an Eastern Wildway. And an Eastern Wildway would be a wildlife <coughs> corridor, but it would, not be, it, would, it would not be a wildlife corridor that was strictly wilderness. It would, be, it would include wilderness, it would include national parks, national wildlife refuges, but it would also include land trust, land trust properties, properties protected by conservation easement, like this beautiful marsh. It would include lands simply owned in a regular way by private individuals but managed in a sustainable fashion, managed with wildlife in mind. And we, we think that one of the more feasible ways for a wild way to run would be through the southeast coastal plain, up some of the major rivers from the southeast coastal plain into the Appalachian foothills and Appalachian mountains and then up along the Appalachians. 
we're not talking about major land use changes for the most part, or certainly not relocating people. We're just talking about better, um, better awareness on the part of landowners, uh, better land conservation on the part of government agencies, and, and reconnecting some of the existing protected areas. We have a very impressive system of protected areas in this country, but they are generally islands. They're isolated patches, and we need to reconnect them for a whole host of reasons that are um, explained by conservation biologists and a great variety of publications. And yeah, among the themes that have, have really become very evident to me on this trek are these five, that we really do need keystone species. We really do need in the east, not everywhere in the east, but in some of the wilder parts of the east, we need to restore the panther, which is the same animal as the cougar. We need to restore the wolf. In some places, that may be the gray wolf. In some places, the red wolf. Uh, we also, in the north, we need the moose. Uh, and we, farther north still, we may we would do benefit from restoring the wolverine. But we need those, t those big animals. We need the top predators. In the absence of wolves and cougars, deer are multiplying to unnaturally high numbers, and they're having adverse effects on our forest communities. They're eating down the, they're eating away the wildflowers and the herbs, and they're preventing the trees from regrowing. We're, we have aging forests that lack the set seedling and sapling layers because we have too many deer out there. The reason there are too many deer is because they don't have their predators. We need wolves and cougars back on the landscape, and they're not going to be here. This, they, they, do, they do need big wild spaces, but they might be in some of the state forests around here and they might be in the national forest northwest of here. Um, the cougars are remarkably elusive creatures. They're actually getting by. They struggle, but they're getting by in Orange County, California. It would be much, I, I suspect it would be much easier to make a safe living in some of the wilder parts of Pennsylvania than in Orange County, California for a big cat. Reaching into Sky Island, southern Arizona. And the basic model that the Wildlands Network is trying to promote is large core reserves surrounded by compatible use zones or buffer zones and connected by wildlife corridors. In the compatible use zones and in some of the wildlife corridors, there would be human habitation as we have across much, much of the east. But generally, wild cores would usually be wilderness or, or national park level protection. And obviously, it's easier to get big parks and wilderness areas established in the west than in the east. But we do have some opportunities in the east as well as in the west. As most of you know, one of the big threats to wildlife in the United States and to a lesser degree in Canada is habitat fragmentation. The biggest source of habitat fragmentation in North America is roads. And one of the painful things I've realized on this journey, I, I should say, my journey is a combination of hiking, paddling, and bicycling. And as I'm bicycling, I, I'm becoming just painfully, viscerally aware of the ways that roads divide and fracture habitats and the way they kill animals. We all use roads. I depend on roads just like the rest of you, but I'm hoping that my trek will help generate awareness that we really ought to think about how we can make our roads more passable for wildlife so that they don't fracture habitats so much and how we might drive in a more conscientious manner so as not to hit animals so often. I'm seeing incredible amounts of roadkill. It's very depressing at times. This wall is along the along the U.S.-Mexico border. I think it's in Texas. And obviously, that wall is going to prevent wildlife movement. And as, as many of you know, that um, under Homeland Security, there's a huge wall being erected along most of the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's a disaster for wildlife. It's much more effective at blocking wildlife movement than human mo movement. <laughs> so basically, we are, it's, a, it's a filter working backwards, you might say. Um, and one antidote to the problems of uh, fragmentation caused by roads is broad overpasses. This one's in Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada. If we would put more of these and tunnels also underneath roads, then they would be more passable to wildlife and we could reduce the problems of road kill and save human lives at the same time. Many people are killed in accidents as they collide with wildlife too. So if we would, as we repair the nation's crumbling infrastructure, also put in underpasses and overpasses and make our roads more durable in the face of climate change, and more permeable to wildlife. We would save money in the long run, and we would save lives. Animals, <coughs> um, animals, including people. So the name of my trek is uh, Trek East, and um, what originally was sort of a solo adventure involving conservation friends and colleagues has grown into something of a communications effort, thanks to the good work of the Wildlands Network, which, by the way, is, is um, simply at wildlandsnetwork.org. And I have a blog, and I do a lot of writing on this journey. It's all on wildlandsnetwork.org. 
They, though I'm basically a Luddite at heart, they've taught me how to use computers and iPhones and so forth. So I am tweeting and blogging, and I think we're, we are even on Facebook in some ways. And Trek East is the popular name we're using for this trip I'm taking, which is basically a, a, a Wild Ways scouting mission. Uh, there's five engines. I'm going roughly, I think it will be about 6,000 miles by the end. I've gone about 4,800 miles so far. I started in North Key Largo in southern Florida, and I'm making my, I made my way through a good bit of the southeast coastal plain and found that in better shape than I had expected, by the way. And now I'm, I'm going up along the Appalachians for the most part. My end goal is the uh, Gas Bay Peninsula of southern Quebec. Hope to, hope to end on cross-country skis in the Chichoc Mountains of southern Quebec in mid-November, if snow permits, otherwise I'll be hiking in cold mud. This is the approximate line I'm taking, obviously it's not at all direct. The reason I'm winding and meandering so much is because I want to meet a broad cross-section of, of conservationists like you folks. I want to meet various conservation groups, government agencies that are involved in land management. I want to see different ecosystem types, habitat types. And the Wildlands Network staff worked very carefully to organize a trip that would allow me to see representative samples of a broad cross-section of ecosystems. So this is the line we came up with, and I've more or less followed that with some deviations. One reason, we were originally thinking the trip was going to be about 4,500 miles, and we're now thinking it would probably be at least 6,000. One reason for the, the difference is that I'm, I'm ending up taking a lot of side trips along the way because there's so many things to see and so many great groups to meet and so forth. So it ends up being a, a longer trip than we had originally anticipated. What we, and one of the goals of this trip is to prom promote the idea of an Eastern Wildway. And an Eastern Wildway would be a wildlife corridor, but it would not be it would, it would not be a wildlife corridor that was strictly wilderness. It would, be, it would include wilderness, it would include national parks, national wildlife refuges, but it would also include land trust, land trust properties, properties protected by conservation easement, like this beautiful marsh. It would include lands simply owned in a regular way by private individuals, but managed in a sustainable fashion, managed with wildlife in mind. And we, we think that one of the more feasible ways for a wild way to run would be through the southeast coastal plain up some of the major rivers from the southeast coastal plain into the Appalachian foothills and Appalachian mountains and then up along the Appalachians. We're not talking about major land use changes for the most part or certainly not relocating people. We're just talking about better, um, better awareness on the part of landowners, uh, better land conservation on the part of government agencies and, and reconnecting some of the existing protected areas. We have a very impressive system of protected areas in this country, but they are generally islands. They're isolated patches, and we need to reconnect them for a whole host of reasons that are um, explained by conservation biologists and a great variety of publications. And yeah, among the themes that have, have really become very evident to me on this trek are these five, that we really do need keystone species. We really do need in the east, not everywhere in the east, but in some of the wilder parts of the east, we need to restore the panther, which is the same animal as the cougar. We need to restore the wolf. In some places that may be the gray wolf, in some places the red wolf. Uh, we also, in the north, we need the moose. Uh, and we, farther north still, we may we would do benefit from restoring the wolverine. But we need those, t those big animals. We need the top predators. In the absence of wolves and cougars, Deer are multiplying to unnaturally high numbers and they're having adverse effects on our forest communities. They're eating down, the, they're eating away the wildflowers and the herbs and they're preventing the trees from regrowing. We're, we have aging forests that lack the set seedling and sapling layers because we have too many deer out there. The reason there are too many deer is because they don't have their predators. We need wolves and cougars back on the landscape and they're not going to be here. This, they, they, be, they do need big wild spaces, but they might be in some of the state forests around here and they might be in the national forest northwest of here. Um, cougars are remarkably elusive creatures. They're actually getting by, they struggle, but they're getting by in Orange County, California. It would be much, I, I suspect it would be much easier to make a safe living in some of the wilder parts of Pennsylvania than in Orange County, California for a big cat. I've also realized more and more as I've traveled that riparian streams and riparian corridors really are crucial. They're crucial for fish, amphibians, other aquatic organisms, but they're also crucial for wide-ranging animals. Again, to talk about the cougar, uh, 
as cougars try to recolonize the East, and it does appear that some of them are trying to do it, typically it's young dispersing males, they often follow river corridors. So if we protect broad riparian buffers along the streams, it will end up with better water quality, more intact aquatic ecosystems, and will allow some of the wide-ranging terrestrial animals to move more freely as well. So I think our, a high conservation priority for much of the East is protecting streams and buffers along them. And Clearwater Conservancy is doing some outstanding work in that regard, and I commend them for that. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to provide safe wildlife, wildlife crossings so that animals can safely cross roads. This has been done successfully in some places. Uh, to give an example that again involves the cougar, uh, the Florida panther, same species as the cougar, is a, is a listed endangered species, so Florida transportation officials and federal transportation officials have been required to put some tunnels beneath I-75, Alligator Alley, that runs north-south through Florida, and they're working. The number of, anim the number of cougars killed on I-75 has dropped sharply since these underpasses were, were, were put in place. We could do the same on many other roads in the east. And again, it would save lives and save money in the long run. We need to encourage good private land stewardship. Private lands conservation is absolutely critical to achieving an eastern wildway. We're, not, we're never going to have enough public, at least not in my lifetime, I don't think we're going to have enough public land in the east to provide enough wildlife habitat. We, we do need good private lands conservation. We need strong financial incentives so that landowners can afford to do the right thing. Most landowners want to do the right thing, but financial pressures tend to push, push landowners in the wrong way. And as those of you here at Millbrook Marsh Nature Center know so well, and as you are working on, we need to be connected to people with nature. And I, I, again, what you're doing here, getting kids out into the marsh, seeing the beavers and the muskrats and, and the cattails and all that, that's vitally important work. We need to be doing that all over the country. Reconnecting ourselves with nature is as important as reconnecting the fragments of nature back together. Um, as I mentioned, I'm traveling by various means, including kayaking, bicycling, hiking, uh, and uh, I, I hope eventually a little bit of cross-country skiing. This is just a scene from southern Florida and kayak. A little bit of swimming in freshwater springs along the way. In, in Florida, as many of you probably know, has an abundance of freshwater springs. Actually, I think the highest concentration is in the world of freshwater springs. Well, I should apologize. I don't yet have slides from Pennsylvania. I haven't had time to... I've just been here a few days. I just had a great couple of days with the Bontas, the Bonta families, whom some of you know, but I haven't had a chance to transfer photos yet. So I, Pennsylvania does not yet appear in my slideshow, but will um, I, I do end up on my bicycle a lot. The bicycling is actually the least interesting part of the trip for me, but because the wild places in the east are, the really wild places are relatively few and far between, I necessarily ride between these places, otherwise I would need years to do all this winding around. Yeah, that's what I've done so far. Yeah, uh, Wildlands Network has been tremendously helpful with logistics as well as communications. And they have a, a great cadre of volunteers throughout the East, and so they, they will arrange to have somebody meet me with a boat, for instance. If I want to leave my bike somewhere and get in a canoe, they'll arrange to have me meet somebody with a canoe and get my bike around to the other side. They've been very, very helpful that way. Later on in the trip, I'll be, I'll be carrying a pack raft, which is a, a, an ultralight inflatable raft. It only weighs about five pounds. Once I'm up in the northern Appalachians, get into some wilder places where I'm not really going to have as much logistical support. I'll be backpacking with a pack raft. But so far, I've, I've had the bicycle with me or near me much of the time. And, and the, as I mentioned, the, the most difficult part of this journey for me is being on roads and, ex and seeing the roadkill. It's heartbreaking. And uh, just a, a painful reminder of how many uh, millions, billions actually, billions of animals are killed every year on American highways. And we don't need to be killing all those animals. And I think we should be working on steps to re reduce that problem. And a lot of people ask me along the way, what's the scariest thing you face out there? And I've met venomous snakes. I've almost stepped on a couple of this trip just out of clum clumsiness. No need to it. come so close to them. Um, they were perfectly docile, didn't give me any trouble. I've met six bears along the way. I've had very nice encounters with them. I've met some other predators, very nice encounters. The, the scariest thing by far is the cars and trucks. The cars and trucks racing past me 
they are frightening. The, the animals are not. This is my home as I'm traveling. It's a little solo tent. That's where I, uh, that's where I do most of my reading and writing as I travel. So if you follow my blog on wildlandsnetwork.org, chances are I, I wrote it in that, that little enclosure, which is so far keeping me fairly dry. We've informally and roughly divided the journey into legs, um, for, just for purposes of planning and for purposes of deciding where I should stop and, meet, and, and spend a little time meeting people. And leg, run, leg one was principally in Florida and southern Alabama, and took me, um, took me in some of, some of the wilder parts of Florida. One of the great lessons, I, one of the important lessons I learned in Florida is, though I, people up north, I think, often assume Florida is either saved or wrecked. You know, it's either, land is either in refuges and parks already, or it's thoroughly developed and lost. It's not nearly that simple a situation. It's really about a third, a third, a third. About one third of Florida is well protected, at least, or at least partially protected in, in parks, refuges, or under conservation easement. About a third is pretty much lost, at least for the time being, to really heavy development. It's you know, Miami and suburbs and so forth. And about a third is undeveloped but unprotected. So a full, fully a third of Florida is still up for grabs, you might say. Most of that is, uh, pri um, almost all of that is private land. A lot of it's cattle ranches. And so one of the highest priorities in terms of conservation in Florida is to get conservation easements or other, other protective measures on those cattle ranches. Uh, one of the really enjoyable stretches of this trip has been paddling the Everglades along the Wilderness Waterway Trail. I highly recommend it if you, any of you enjoy paddling and intend to get down to southern Florida. It's a really nice 110 or so mile trip through, um, through a lot of the really beautiful country in the Everglades. I did the trip with some, some friends and colleagues from the Wildlands Network and we had a great time. Saw manatees and dolphins and crocodiles and alligators and sawfish and thousands of water birds and so forth, just a great, great trip. Those are the crocodiles we met near the beginning of the other day. Uh, this, um, the bike is there leaning against a, a sign warning about the Panthers crossing on Tamiami Highway, which runs east-west, just north of the Everglades, and unfortunately probably to some degree fragmenting the habitat between the Everglades and Big Cypress. This road, unlike the nearby Alligator Alley does not have wildlife crossings, and road kills a terrible problem on this road. It does, it needs, it urgently needs wildlife crossings. There is a, an effort afoot to actually raise at least one mile, maybe even more than five miles of the road to allow restored water flow beneath it, because this road is also blocking the natural flow of water into the Everglades. So conservationists led by the Sierra Club and others in Florida trying to get the Army Corps of Engineers to to liter literally elevate about five miles of the road that will allow wildlife movement and water flow be a very beneficial measure. Again, the saddest thing I'm encountering is roadkill. This is a, a dead coyote. I, I was on a side trip here. I am getting in cars uh, on side trips with colleagues fairly often to see di you know, distant places that I would not easily be able to reach with the bicycle. We are on our way to Sipsi Wilderness in the Bankhead National Forest in northern Alabama when they encountered this dead coyote. As I mentioned a moment ago, the, the importance of private land stewardship really cannot be emphasized. Uh, and again, in Florida, one of the big challenges is to get conservation easements on the ranch lands. The couple on, in the, on the upper left of this slide, the Clay family, have had a cattle ranch in the family for more than five generations. They want to stay on the land, they want to keep the land intact. The financial pressures are making it very difficult for them to do so. So Tommy Clay has taken the initiative of working with neighboring ranchers to try to keep their holdings intact and not have to sell out for a subdivision. And so far he's, he's, he's been quite successful. And uh, it's a, he's a, I would say, a model rancher. Um, some of the biological research stations in the East are doing really creative and important conservation work. This is Archbold Biological Research Station in Central Florida, Lake Wales Ridge area. The Florida scrub jay there is one of the most endangered birds in North America, and the scientists there are doing some very good work in studying this bird and finding its needs. They've also done some interesting work following black bears. They've collared, put radio collars on black bears and followed them. And one of the bears they were tracking uh, literally 
chose the route that conservation biologists would have told the bear to take. That is, the conservation biologists, including Mead Noss, a friend of mine, have mapped wildlife corridors, or proposed wildlife corridors throughout Florida. One of the bears they tagged literally followed the corridor system that they'd drawn on maps, which was confirmation of the, impo of the importance of wildlife corridors. And then, as, as Reed Noss might have predicted, it got the bear reached a major high east-west highway that did not have a wildlife underpass, and the bear promptly turned around and came back by the same system of wildlife corridors. Uh, leg two of the journey took me through uh, much of Alabama and Georgia. And one of, the one of the lessons I took from that area is we really need a big area of protected longleaf pine forest. There's no major area of longleaf pine uh, in our national park system or in our wilderness preservation system. There's some small areas, but nothing big. And, and the longleaf pine ecosystem used to cover about 90 million acres of the southeastern United States, and yet very little of it is protected. And there are some great opportunities in the Florida Panhandle in southern Alabama to add to our protected area system and perhaps even to create a big national park. This is, a, this is what the Longleaf Pine Forest looks like where it has been somewhat restored. In, in the four Euro-Americans cut it down, the trees grew bigger uh, and the grasses might have been lusher, but this is roughly what the Longleaf Pine is. It's a very, very beautiful ecosystem. I think if we created a Longleaf Pine National Park, it would be a real attraction for wildlife watchers and tourists. Um, one of the species that depends on the longleaf pine is the red cockaded wood woodpecker, famous among bird watchers and endangered species advocates. This is a wood red cockaded woodpecker hole in a longleaf pine in Holly's sheltered game lands in North Carolina. We were actually fortunate enough to see five of the birds themselves on this particular island. Leg three of the trip took me farther into the southeast coastal plain. One of the real pleasures was seeing a good bit of the Ace Basin. It's a, a relatively intact part of the southeast coastal plain where they, in South Carolina, where the Ashipu, the Cumbahee, and the Edisto rivers empty into the ocean. And these are the s sorts of rivers that are still relatively intact and where we could, through restoration and conservation, eventually have broad riparian buffers that allow animals to move from the coast up into the foothills and even into the mountains. Um, in Alabama, one of the outstanding natural areas is the, Ca the Cahaba River, which has the highest diversity of uh, freshwater mussels of any river in the United States, possibly any river in the world. I'm, here I'm with Nature Conservancy and Cahaba River Society and Alabama Rivers Alliance staff and biologists, and they're, they would occasionally lean out of their canoes, grab a handful of gravel, and show me about 12 or 13 different mussel species in a single and full of gravel. The diversity there is just astonishing. There's an opportunity there to create a big Cahaba River National Wildlife Refuge, another very high conservation priority. This beautiful tree is called simply the big tree. It's a, um, Ed knows about it. It's quite famous among old growth enthusiasts. It's 150 feet tall and about eight feet in diameter. It's a tulip poplar. It's in the Sipsi Wilderness in northern Alabama. And this is, this is the sort of tree we ought to see a lot more of in the east. And if we do our work well and reconnect and protect places and allow forests to grow naturally, we could see more trees like this, if not in our lives, in our children's lives anyway. This, this, is, this is a very inspiring place in the city wilderness. One of the um, more interesting proposals I learned about along the way was for, is for uh, an Okmulgee National Park uh, near, around the Macon, Georgia area where there's already a national monument, a small, modest-sized Okmulgee National Monument centered around some very important Native American earthworks. There's, a, there's an opportunity in this area along the Okmulgee River to combine archaeological and historic interests of preserving Native American sites, working with Native American groups, and enlarging the protected area to also um, take in, uh, to take advantage of more opportunities for land conservation as well as Native American site protection. And there's some great students at the university there and law professors who are leading the effort to protect the area and to expand it into an Okmulgee National Park. Uh, in Lake Four, I got farther into North Carolina and made my way and finally from the southeast coastal plain into the foothills of North Carolina and then on into the southern Appalachians. 
Oh, back to the A space, and I, I should have shown this slide earlier, actually. The A space in the, has some really incredibly wildlife rich areas. This is a state wildlife management area in South Carolina. Those lumps in the water there are alligators. There were at least 50 alligators visible from this one spot, as well as herons <laughs> seemingly unbothered by the alligators and trees around it. Just amazing wildlife there. And, uh, and some of the richest wildlife habitat in the A Basin and elsewhere in the southeast coast of Plain, much of it is actually privately owned. Nature Conservancy and, and, and other land trusts are working to get conservation easements on much of the land. Habitat connectivity is important not just for big, wide-ranging animals, but also for some of the smaller animals. So there's a biologist in this picture holding gopher frog eggs. Gopher frogs also are harmed by habitat fragmentation. They are often associated with gopher tortoises. They sometimes live in gopher tortoise burrows. Gopher tortoises tend to be harmed by roads and other forms of habitat fragmentation. Gopher, to and gopher frogs also suffer when gopher tortoise populations decline. So gopher tortoises and gopher frogs are examples of smaller species that are harmed by habitat frag fragmentation and conversely helped by habitat reconnection. These are uh, the Venus flycaps here are unique to a small area around Wilmington, wildlands around Wilmington, North Carolina. We visited a couple of wildlife reserves that were rich in Venus flycaps and, and, other, and other flowering plants. This is a red wolf in a holding pen in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Alli the red wolf originally ranged across much of the southeastern United States. It's a, another keystone species, a top predator that helps control numbers of deer and other smaller animals. And there's been a successful reintroduction effort in Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge on the coast of North Carolina. But unfortunately, that's the only place they've been in reintroduced, so they don't really function effectively in much of the southeast. They, they could be helping keep deer numbers in check across much of the southeast, but right now they're limited. How big are they? How big are they? Well, they they're work. smaller than gray wolves, but they're, they're usually bigger than coyotes. They're actually very closely related to the coyote, and there's still debate about um, the genetic differences between gray wolves, red wolves, and coyotes. And some people think the red wolf is sort of halfway between gray wolf and coyote in size and behavior, but I think it's not quite that simple. But to, I would say about the size of a large coyote or a large German shepherd. I talked to a wildlife guy a while back, and they were going back to specimens of so-called wolves, like in a museum in Pittsburgh, and doing DNA tests. Mm -hmm. Apparently there's some sort of suspicion that we never had gray wolves in Pennsylvania, that what we had was some form of uh, an eastern canine, uh, which might have been something like the red wolf, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I've, I've heard the t term um, canis supus. Canis lupus is the gray wolf, and canis supus is a sort of facetious term to suggest that the, the canids have interbred a fair amount. Their, their, their genomes are ra rather plastic, I guess. And yeah, the wolf that we're supposed to, I live in the Adirondacks in northern New York, and the wolf we're supposed to have there has cut, we're not even sure. We might have had the gray wolf, we might have had the red wolf, we might have had both, or we might have had something that was a bit different. The Algonquin wolf genetically apparently is more closely related to the red wolf than to the gray wolf, and the Algonquin wolf is in Ontario. So there, there are a lot of questions, but I think the important point to make is that we need a big canid that can eat deer. And, and keep deer moving, keep deer moving so they're not over browsing areas. And in the north, we need a big canid that can take moose. And red wolves probably would not take moose. Nature Conservancy and other land trusts are doing some very interesting work on climate adaptation in different parts of the country, but here they're, they're trying to buffer the coastline um, near Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in the face of rising sea levels. So sea levels have already risen measurably, as most of you know, and uh, you know, wave surges are battering the coast increasingly, including in otherwise protected areas. And there's saltwater intrusion into some of the protected areas along the coast in the southeast. So the Nature Conservancy is reseeding oyster beds off Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, coast of North Carolina, and trying to close some of the unneeded canals that are allowing the saltwater intrusion as some partial measures to, toward alleviating the effects of climate change and sea level rise. It's a, a very ambitious effort on the part of the Nature Conservancy to, to essentially make 
help ecosystems be more durable in the face of human-caused climate change. Here I'm with some, some great conservationists with the, the zoo, in, the North Carolina Zoo in, in the Uari Mountains area of the North Carolina foothills, and with some land trust folks. Uh, this is a longleaf pine forest, very rare forest types these days in the foothills of North Carolina. There's not much longleaf pine left, most of it was cut down. And what, from my experience in trekking through the southeast, I've, I've come to believe that one of the highest priority areas for conservation is the foothills. We've done a relatively good job of protecting the mountains in the southern Appalachians. Not good enough, but we've done a relatively good job. And we've actually protected more of the coast than I would have thought. But the foothills, are, there's not much protection in the foothills. And if you, do, if you, if you end up developing all, or, or over logging, logging excessively the whole of the, the foothill area, then you pretty much severed the connection between the coast and the mountains. So these good conservationists and others are trying to raise awareness about the importance of protecting foothills habitat. The Piedmont is vitally important, and they are achieving some success through what they're calling the Uari Conservation Partnership. This is, um, here I'm finally into the Southern Appalachians. Ed, I think you know Rob Messick. He's a, a great old growth. I know Austin, but yeah, also. Great old growth researcher and sleuth. He finds big old trees throughout the Southern Appalachians and documents them and figure, de de delineates remaining areas of old growth and has actually managed to show the Forest Service that some of their timber sales were targeting what was not, had not been recognized as, but was actually old growth forest. And he's managed to save some of the old growth forests that might have otherwise been logged. Here he's standing by another big tulip poplar in a, an area of old growth forest near Curtis Creek, just south of the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina. One of, one of the other really sad things I experienced on this trip was visiting Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest, which is part of a, a wilderness area, the Joyce Kilmer Forest, Slick Rock Canyon Wilderness Area in the Southern Appalachians of, of North Carolina. The hemlock woolly adelgid got into this forest. Most of you are aware of the dangers of invasive species, and you folks deal with them here in the marsh. And we, we all deal with them. Throughout the East, we deal with invasive species. They do tend to, to, to displace native species. They cause various sorts of ecological problems. The hemlock woolly adelgid, which belongs in Asia, not in North America, is uh, sickening and even killing hemlock trees uh, throughout the East. Ed just told me a, a few minutes ago that, unfortunately, almost all the big hemlocks in the Smokies have been have died because of the hemlock willia delta. And here the Forest Service took the rather extreme measure of dynamiting the trees to the ground after they died. Uh, this, this is a, and I heard different accounts of why they did that. You know, the, the simplest explanation is they were worried the trees would fall on people because this is a very, this old growth forest, it's a grand, magnificent place, people like to walk there, and they were worried the trees might fall on them. And it's possible that Dynamite is considered more consistent with the wilderness movement than chainsaws. I'm not sure about that. But in any case, uh, sadly, the trees, the hemlocks, died and have been dynamited to the ground. Here I, um, I did a nice hike along the Appalachian Trail through Great Smoky Mountains National Park, one of my favorite parts of the trip so far. I think it's about 110 miles. Really wonderful hiking, most of it high up with beautiful views in all directions. Here I'm on, I think it's called. Uh, Thunder Mountain, I believe, I forget. Anyway, I'm near the beginning of, the, of my, when I first gotten up high on the hike, I, I went west to east or southwest to northeast. And uh, just, Smokies are just absolutely beautiful. They, they, are, they too are having problems with acid rain and invasive species. And there are some opportunities being missed in the Southern Appalachians in terms of protecting roadless areas. But still, it's a, it's a great wildlands complex on which we can help build a larger eastern wildlands. Here I'm on Mount Rogers in southwest Virginia, where there apparently are some remnants of old growth forest, hardwoods on the slopes and a spruce fir on the mountaintop. Mount Rogers itself is quite well protected, but the mountain across the valley, White Top, unfortunately has a road to the top and communication towers on it. This is a, a beautiful rocky area above Blanton Forest, which is a 3,000 acre remnant of old growth forest in southeast Kentucky. This area is very important for the old growth forest itself, but also because Pine Mountain, on which Blant, of which Blanton Forest is a part, is a, is a key wildlife corridor for black bears and a reintroduced population of elk 
and other wide-ranging species, and a great little group, great land trust called Kentucky Natural Lands Trust, is leading the effort to keep plants and forests safe and to enlarge the protected area to take in much of Pine Mountain. At this point, I've made it to Kentucky, central Kentucky, and I'm tagging along with biologist James Wagner, who's an insect and spider specialist, and he's looking for He's looking for rare insects and spiders to show us. This is a beautiful little nature preserve called Flora Cliff. One of the great conservation themes in the East and actually throughout North America is private individuals and families using their, 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 their own money to save wild places. And this, this place was saved by a, a biology professor named Mary Horton who never, never made a lot of money. She was just a, a modestly paid professor at a little college called Georgetown College, but she saved her money for decades and managed to piece together this wildlife reserve and then in, in her will took, um, put measures in place that would keep it forever safe for wildlife. And this is another scene from Flora Cliff, again in Fayette County, central Kentucky. Uh, well, this gets us up to near where uh, this gets us to here. And so uh, like six and seven of Trek East, I've, um, I've gone to parts of Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the most inspiring stories I will be telling in the coming months is about Highlands Nature Sanctuary, Arc of Appalachia Preserve System. It's the edge of the Appalachian Mountains in southeast Ohio. You would not expect conservationists to be able to save much in densely populated southeast Ohio, but Nancy Stranahan in the foreground here, her partner Bruce Lombardo, and their friend, uh, their, well, their various friends, I'm forgetting names, but various friends and, co and colleagues of theirs have managed to piece together several thousand acres of protected habitat and created a wildlife corridor to this edge of Appalachia ecosystem. It's a very inspiring effort. Uh, they are leading, any of you want to look that up there, I think their website is arcofappalachia.org. Here I am in the Dallas Sods Wilderness. Some of you may be familiar with the West Virginia Highlands, Monongahela National Forest. Beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, Dolly Sods Wilderness is a great wild place, but it, it could be bigger. There's some unneeded, at least in my opinion, unneeded Forest Service roads around the wilderness, that, the closure of which would save taxpayers money, increase habitat security for animals, and allow the Dolly Sods Wilderness to be expanded. One of the really inspiring proposals I heard was from a little group called Friends of Blackwater Canyon. And they are suggesting that this area and a lot of the land around it, in fact, much of Monongahela National Forest be um, upgraded to a national park. And they're, they're suggesting the name High Allegheny National Park. It's a great proposal. It, be, it could be something like half a million acres in size and protect some of the East's most spectacular landscapes. My wife Denise in the trekking shirt there, my friend the artist Kevin Rains in the blue shirt, and gunpowder riverkeeper Theo Lagarde. Um, Theo is an example of a, a tireless riverkeeper. Some of you have heard of the Waterkeeper Network started by Bobby Kennedy. Uh, gunpowder Riverkeeper is an example of one of those organizations. The Gunpowder River is not that far from here. It's, it's north of Baltimore, drains into the Chesapeake Bay, and, and is surprisingly intact. That you feel like you're walking along or paddling a mountain stream when you're on this river. And its health and integrity is thanks in large part to gunpowder riverkeeper. Along with the inspiring wildlife sightings I've had, I have been inspiring meetings with a great cross-section of the conservation community and a great number of landowners and government agency officials and so forth. These are just, this is just a small sampling of some of the really inspiring people I've met along the way. And it's easy to get discouraged if your work is, is trying to protect the natural world. We, we lose a lot of ground every, every year. And I, I, I took this trek partly to try to reinvigorate or re, um, give myself encouragement about the, the prospects for protecting nature in eastern North America. And the wildlife sightings I've had and the really great work done by people like these has given me a lot of encouragement, a lot of hope. So I would end the slideshow by suggesting that any of you who are interested in the vision of an eastern wildway or simply in reconnecting wildlife habitats, whether on a local scale, regional scale, or continental scale, a good way to, a good way to begin is to go to the Wildlands Network website, which is simply wildlandsnetwork.org, and see how you can get involved. 
Um, but remember also that the, the local and regional groups like Clearwater Conservancy and Millbrook Marsh Nature Center and other land trusts in the area, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, Nature Conservancy, and so forth, they're doing the important work on the ground. Support those groups. They're doing really, really great work. Also see Ed's website, nativetreesociety.org, if you're interested in old growth forests. And if you, any of you have groups that you would like to um, have mentioned this evening, please speak up and, and name them, because they're, you know, to, to actually protect nature across North America, it, it will take, as Michael Sule, conservation biologist friend of mine says, networks of people protecting networks of wild ones, and that's what I'm trying to encourage. I'm, I've been focusing largely on relatively happy stories, conservation success stories on this trip, but I do talk in my blog about the threats. There's no way of ignoring them. I face them every day of this trek. I'm trying not to dwell on them, because <laughs> They get overwhelming, but the, the energy-related threats in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Kentucky and throughout the country are, are, are positively scary, absolutely immense. And I suspect that those of us who are basically full-time conservationists are going to spend much of the rest of our lives trying to fight off the worst of these projects. Uh, I personally don't think giant wind turbines are the answer. I, coal mining, in my opinion, is harmful to the very core because of the carbon emissions and the, and the strip mining itself. I, I support wind energy, but I think it should be done on a smaller, more local scale. I don't think, I don't want to see giant wind turbines on ridge tops. I think that's going to end up meaning more habitat fragmentation. I think we should be thinking about decentralized energy, energy production, wind and solar especially. Um, but that's a, it's a vexing problem and um, I, I have faced it quite a bit on the journey and I will face it more. I know the Marcellus Shale areas I will be seeing quite soon. You mentioned that the coastal plain was in better condition than you thought it would be. I was just curious if you thought of the uh, Appalachian Spine so far, better or worse than you thought? I think a little bit better, yeah. Um, there's a, there, you know, along with, along with creating safe wildlife crossings and educating drivers about how to be less likely to hit animals. One of the really good things we could do to our transportation system, in my opinion, is close some of the unnecessary roads. We have, I think, more than a million miles of road in the United States at this point. A lot of that really is not needed. I'm not talking about closing the roads we're seeing out there, but Forest Service lands are just absolutely laced with logging roads that really are not needed, yeah. that might make nice footpaths or mountain bike trails, but are not needed for motor vehicles. One of the better steps we could take in much of the Appalachian Mountains, in my opinion, is look carefully at the national forest lands and figure out which roads really do serve useful purposes and which do not. And start closing those that do not. It, t it, takes, it costs thousands of dollars a year to maintain roads. It's very expensive to taxpayers. And they tend to degrade water quality, fragment wildlife habitat, and so forth. So it would be a fairly straightforward measure, I think, to get the, if we could convince the Forest Service to do this. If we would close unneeded Forest Service roads, we would see a much wilder Appalachian mountain chain in the fairly near term. Um, so there are a lot of things we need to do to make the Appalachians wild enough to accommodate wolves and chanthers, for instance. But I, I, think this, I think the steps we need to take are quite achievable. Not out of a... Not out of